Good, Good morning, morning, church. Hi, welcome. We're the Scruggs family. We would like to welcome the three churches, Ross Carrick Church of Christ, Oak Park Church of Christ, and Hope for Life Christian Fellowship. We've got a passage for you this morning that uh, I'm going to pre be preaching on later from Psalm 40 we'd like to read for you on this beautiful day. I waited and waited and waited for God. At last he looked, finally he listened. He lifted me out of the ditch, pulled me from deep mud. He stood me up on, on a solid rock to make sure I wouldn't slip. He taught me how to sing the latest God song, a praise song to our God. More and more people are seeing this. They enter the mystery, abandoning themselves to God. Blessed are you who give yourselves over to God. Turn your backs on the world, sure thing. Ignore what the world worships. The world's a huge stockpile of God wonders and God thoughts. Nothing and no one comes close to you. I start talking about you, telling what I know, and quickly run out of words. Neither numbers nor words account for you. Doing something for you, bringing something to you. That's not what you're after, being religious, act, acting pious. That's not what you're asking for. You've opened my ears so I can listen. So I answered, I'm coming. I, I read in your letter what you wrote about me. And I'm coming to the party. You, you're throwing for me. That's when God's word entered my life became part of my, my very being. I preached you to the whole congregation. I've kept back nothing. God, you know that. I didn't keep the news of your ways a secret. Didn't keep it to myself. I told it all how dependable you are, how thorough you are. I, I didn't hold back pieces of love and truth for myself alone. I told it all. Let the congregation know the whole story. Now, God, don't hold out on me. Don't hold back your passion. Your love and truth are all that keeps me together. When troubles gang up on me, a mob of sin past counting. I was swamped by guilt. I couldn't see my, my way clear. More guilt in my heart than hair on my head. So heavy the guilt that my heart gave out. Soften up, God, and intervene. Hurry up and get me some help. So those who are trying to kidnap my soul will be embarrassed and lose face. So anyone who gets a kick out of making me miserable will be heckled and disgraced. So those who pray for my ruin will be booed and jeered without mercy. But all who are hunting for you, oh, let them sing and be happy. Let those who know what you're all about tell the world you're great and not quitting. And me? I'm a mess. I'm nothing and have nothing. Make something of me. You can do it. You've got what it takes. But God, don't put it off. Have a blessed day, church. Bye. Bye. Good morning. Welcome. Let's worship the Lord together as we sing together.
confess, bowing here, I find my rest, and without you, I fall apart, you're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you, oh, I need you, every hour I need you, my one defense, my righteousness, oh, sin runs deep your grace is more where grace is found is where you are and where you are Lord I am free holiness is Christ in me and where you Teach my soul to rise to you when temptation comes my way. And when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. And when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness, oh God. Those last lines really lead into what we're going to do now. We're going to take some time, and I'm going to read to you a prayer of confession from an old uh, prayer manual written by someone named John Bailey. And those last lines really open the door. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh God, how I need you. See, when we get off the hook for having to be righteous and let Jesus do that for us, it frees us up to go back to our Cultivate series. It frees us up to analyze what's in the garden of our lives, for better and for worse. And where we find the for worse, the Bible tells us we confess our sins to God, to one another. And we receive forgiveness, and God meets us in our weakness. But we need not worry about how he's going to respond. We know he's going to say, who condemns you now? Neither they nor I. Go and sin no more. So let me just read you some of these lines. This is from another age. Uh, this book is over 100 years old, and other ages sometimes open up other things. So would you just posture yourself to hear from God, ask him to convict you. There's going to be a series of questions. Uh, and then at the end, I'm going to give you just a minute to pray to God if there's anything that comes to mind that you need to confess.
Here's what it says. It was meant to be an evening prayer, but why don't you think about the last couple days as I ask these questions. It begins, O merciful Father, you look on the weakness of your human children more in pity than in anger and more in love than in pity. So help me now in your holy presence to examine the secrets of my heart. Have I done anything today to fulfill the purpose for which you brought me into the world? Have I accepted the opportunities of service that in your wisdom you have put before me? Have I performed the duties of the day without leaving any undone? Give me grace to answer honestly. Have I done anything today to damage the Christian ideal of true humanity? Have I been lazy in body or listless in spirit? Have I overindulged my bodily appetites? Have I kept my imagination pure and healthy? Have I been scrupulously honorable in all my dealings? Have I been transparently sincere in all I have claimed to be, to feel, or to do? Give me grace to answer honestly, Lord? Have I tried today to see myself as others see me? Have I made more excuses for myself than I have been willing to make for others? Have I been a peacemaker in my own home, or have I stirred up trouble? Have I, while professing noble convictions for great causes, failed, even in common love, and courtesy towards those nearest to me. Give me grace to answer honestly, Lord. And he finishes, Lord, it is only your infinite love demonstrated to us in Jesus Christ, which has the power to destroy the empire of evil in my heart. Grant that with each day that passes, I may more and more be delivered from the sins that keep tempting me. Amen. Take a minute. If there's something from that that you need to confess to God, do that while I play, and then we're going to sing some more. sing together. I flirt with the world. It steals my love for you. My fear grips my faith, and I am left unmoved. Your gaze stops my heart. Your voice fills the dark. Your love is the spark that lights this life. So we rise out of the depths you cry. Come and be satisfied. Father, you sing. Father, you sing over your children. You quiet the storm inside my shipwrecked soul. Your spirit will lead. It calls the wayward home. At the sound of your name, our sin is washed away. In Christ we're crucified, in you we die, in you we rise, out of the depths you cry, come and be satisfied, Father you sing, Father you sing.
let us see through your eyes. We are your great delight. Father, you sing, Father, you sing over your children. Oh, let us see through your eyes. We are your great Father, you sing, Father, you sing over your children. Well, good morning. It is uh, great to be with you this morning. Looking forward to walking through the Psalms with you. Let's, uh, let's start with a word of prayer. Father, we stop for a few moments this morning to take some time to open your word. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you would come and fill our hearts and our minds, that you would speak in and through the scriptures that we might 
hear the Father's heart, that we might uh, know His ways, that we might walk in them, that we might take His laws and statutes and and put them into our hearts. We're thankful for the Psalms that they teach us how to pray through life in a very real and tangible way. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we in the last series, we as in Tim, Lane, and myself, uh, worked very hard to make sure that uh, everybody who heard us understood that spiritual growth as it happens and as we strive to, to grow spiritually, uh, that it happens in every kind of facet of life. So it's, it's not something that's separate. We don't, we don't segregate uh, our spiritual growth as a different compartment. It, it actually happens, and we, we try to take the different areas of life to really highlight this. The, the Psalms uh, do this in a very epic way. They take us through this, these various journeys of, of people's hearts and minds and lives and show us and tell us how to speak to God in a very real and tangible way. For some reason, though, we as humans have this uh, notion or this uh, way of trying to separate our spirituality, and we almost try to disconnect it. We, we don't like it attached to the physical because the physical side of life is, uh, can be really messy. It's dirty. It's grimy. We don't, we don't like it, a part of it. We think somehow spirituality should be clean, that somehow spirituality should be different from our physicality. And so we work hard to try and uh, heighten our spirituality, but we do that often uh, in separation from the physical. Uh, An example that I can think of that is common for me, and and maybe common for you too, is perhaps you've walked through a show home. Have you ever done that with with somebody? Walked through a, a brand new show home built by a builder. When you walk through a show home, or, or maybe even just a home that's been staged, ready for sale, uh, what you notice is that it's, uh, for one thing, pretty impersonal. And that's a point, there's a point to that. The, the reason that stagers and designers do this is so that we can see ourselves in the space. Uh, it's very clean, it's very tidy, it's very organized, and we like that. We go into these homes thinking, oh, this just feels so good. I, I, could, I can see myself here. This just seems so relaxing, pristine. And that's the point when you walk through a show home or a staged home, is to get that feeling for you that this is the place for you, a place where you can come and be comfortable, a, a place where you can feel at home. But then we go home to our real homes, and often, maybe not for you, but often for many of us, we go home, and it's a different reality. Uh, There's papers maybe stacked in different places and and clothes piled in other places, Uh, and, and you start to notice and recognize that the show home was missing some things. It was missing some things that uh, are pretty common and very necessary in your home. Things like garbage cans, often, which are not there, uh, or laundry baskets, uh, plungers, and uh, toilet brushes. Yeah, there's there's reasons that show homes look a certain way. Uh, we, We don't want to be reminded about the work at home. We don't want to be reminded about the mess or the dirt, the walls and edges and, and uh, railings that we need to clean because little hands and big hands have been on them plenty of times without cleaning. And so I think our spiritual, spirituality, our, our idea of spirituality is similar. 
We have this picture in our head that somehow spirituality is separate from our real life. That it's a different life that we're trying to get after. And uh, the Psalms just bring us back down to reality. And they teach us that God is in all things. Now, God isn't things, let's be clear on that. Certainly, the the scriptures are very clear and Hebrew people were very clear that, that things are not God. We don't make idols out of things, but God draws us to himself in and through all things. Sometimes uh, we're trying to connect to God in a way that is like the show home. We're trying to separate ourselves, become more spiritual, just be within our thoughts, and maybe even be outside of our thoughts, focusing on God rather than on the realities around us. We like to use big spiritual words and phrases Uh, trying to connect with God in a way that we think he wants us to connect. Uh, I want to make sure that when I'm talking to God that the way I word this is a way in which God will listen to me, a way in which God will respond. And we get caught up in this. I know that Having been somebody who grew up in the church, I, I often get caught up in this because I've, I've heard so many prayers over the years and I often get caught up in trying to say my prayers in a certain way, whether it's publicly or whether it's privately. I remember probably 20 years ago, not probably, it was about 20 years ago, when uh, a friend of mine who was in his 20s as well, early 20s, uh, came to know Christ. And he had no church background. He came into uh, the church on his own, essentially, and he accepted Christ. He found Jesus. And we became friends, and, and I started to hang out with him more and, and be a part of you know small groups and whatnot with him. And what was amazing to me, I was always fascinated and uh, rejuvenated when I heard him pray because his prayers were simple. His prayers were real. There was no vibrato on, you know, God and all these big words and phrases. It was simple things like, hey, uh, here I am again, not really sure how I'm supposed to talk to you. It was such a refreshing refreshing thing to me, to hear simple prayers, to, to hear him talk to God in a very personal way. Eugene Peterson, uh, in his book, Answering God, has this to say. He says, Jesus used anything at hand to bring us into the awareness of God and then into a response to God. The moment Jesus picked up something, it was clear that it was not alien, but it was belonging. A piece of God's creation that was a means for meeting God. Jugs of water at Cana, the sound of the wind in Jerusalem, Galilean sea waves, a paralytic's pallet at the Bethzathan pool, the the corpse of Lazarus, things, materially made things. He goes on to use a quote from C.S. Lewis, and it says this, there is no good trying to be more spiritual than God. God never meant man to be purely spiritual, be a purely spiritual creature. That is why he used material things like bread and wine, to put new life in us. We may think this rather crude and unspiritual. God doesn't. He invented eating. He liked matter. He invented it. 
I think this is so crucial as we go into the Psalms. And, and the reason I wanted to, to start with this is because Psalm 40, which we're going to talk about this morning, is, is clearly uh, about getting dirty. <laughs> it's about a reality uh, that sometimes we're stuck in our own mess and so if you want to turn in your Bibles to Psalm 40, I'm going to be switching back between the NIV and the message. So the message, as some of you know, and maybe some of you do not know, was a, a, a paraphrased translation of Psalms by Eugene Peterson, who was a, a pastor and, and theologian and writer. And uh, I, love, I love that the Psalms are translated this way because Psalms originally, like I said, they're, they're plain language. They're talking to God. And, and so I love going to, to read uh, the Psalms in the message because it's plain language. It's simplified. It's saying it in today's terms. And so I want to use it this morning. Psalm 40 is kind of broken down into three different sections in my in my opinion let's say that um, but it's kind of broken down in a very odd manner uh, if you look at it you you kind of wonder did they mix up the order uh, because there's this first section which is this story of rescue and then there's this second section which is a praise to God and talking about his good deeds and then there's a third section which is a plea for help and it seems like they're kind of mixed up, as in maybe the plea for help should have been first, and then there should have been the rescue, and then there should have been uh, the praise for God. Uh, maybe, maybe it was mixed up. Uh, I don't think it really matters, but, but I think there's a purpose to this. And I think the purpose is we see in the first three verses this, uh, really, this gospel message that the psalm the psalmist brings. And, and this is, the psalm says that it's a, a, a psalm of David. In the NIV, verse 1 says, I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. Uh, I want us to start in this section. I'm not going to mix them up at all because uh, this is the way it comes through the scripture, but also because isn't it true that the gospel message, the good news, is that God rescues us. How important is that for us to keep at the forefront of our mind? So maybe the psalmist saw this way. Maybe it was David who saw it this way. I, I'll tell you how things went, but first, let me just get to the point. The point is, I was in need of help. I love how Eugene Peterson uh, translates this. He says, I waited and waited and waited for God. It's different because if you look at the NIV and many of the other translations, they talk about waiting patiently for God. And I, and I wonder sometimes, really, am I waiting patiently for God? No. Typically, I am not waiting patiently because to me, when I define patience, it has to do with Calmly, nicely, uh, not asking God over and over again. But really, there's a, there's a, there's a, in this terminology, it's an, an attention. It's about this commitment that David has to God. I waited patiently for God. Patiently doesn't mean he was like, yeah, no, no worries. Whenever you get here, I'm good. No. I think what it's trying to convey here is that, God, is that David understood that God would answer. And so sometimes in our lives, I think the, the message here is the way we need to think about it, is that we need to wait and wait and wait on the Lord. As in, he is our only option. He is our only rescue. And we may not like how long he takes, but he will come. He will answer. And so it says, I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit. Love that language. You know, we were trying to be extraordinarily spiritual. We wouldn't say slimy pit, right? We wouldn't use this type of language. 
But often in the Psalms, we see this metaphor for ways in which we describe things and the ways in which the psalmist wants to describe things. So he lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. When we hear this type of language, this metaphorical language used by the psalmist, uh, we can usually think about dirt and filth and slime and pit about kind of our own sin. That's what he's talking about. And so here we have David talking about being in this slimy pit. We all know that this is a place that we've gotten ourselves into. This is our own muck. This is our own mess. We've gotten ourselves into. I mean, picture yourself in, in, in quicksand. I, I've seen some videos lately. I don't know why they were popping up for me, but some videos of, of people in quicksand and, and how they can get themselves stuck in it and then how fighting it gets you just in it farther. And, I, and that's so true about our lives. We're so good at getting ourselves into a mess getting stuck in it. And the more we struggle, the more we decide that we're going to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, the deeper we go. We can't rescue ourselves. We can't do it. And so the psalmist continues, he lifted me up out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. This reiteration is how the Psalms are all, are writ- are all written. That I, I'll tell it to you one way and then I'm going to tell it to you another way. He put my feet on a rock. He gave me a firm place to stand. This is the foundation that God is doing. This is the rescue that he has for us, that he does not just rescue us from the sand and put us on the side. He, he rescues us out of the mess and he finds a firm foundation for us, that he points us and directs us and, and plants our feet on something firm. As the message says, it says, he stood me up on a solid rock to make sure I wouldn't slip. God wants to make sure that we can move forward, that we are on his foundation, the foundation of Jesus. He goes on to say, he put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. Again, I got to go over to the message. Uh, it It says it this way, He taught me how to sing the latest God song, a praise song to our God. More and more people are seeing this. They enter the mystery, abandoning themselves themselves to God. You see, friends, why this gospel message is so important and, and why it needs to be the first thing in our lives to come out of our mouths our own gospel story about how God has rescued us is because when people hear it, people turn to Jesus and can experience their own rescue story. When people hear what God is doing, things change in their lives because they start seeing God at work instead of seeing and trying to do it on their own. And that's why I believe the psalmist has written this first. This is why this is the important part. You need to hear the rescue because until you hear that something great has happened, change has happened, transformation has happened, that I am now on firm footing, going in the right direction, then things won't change for other people because they're not going to be interested. If we come at people just telling them that they need God, but not telling them how he's changed us. We're missing a huge piece of the story of what God is doing. So that's the end of the first section. And this goes into the second section here, verses four and and four to 10. It says, blessed is the one who does not look to the proud, to those who turn aside to false gods. The writer in Psalms here is is saying, look, you are blessed 
you will find joy and peace and happiness when you turn away from the world's ways of doing things. When you turn away from your way of doing things. That's why, going back to the message, Eugene Peterson writes it this way, blessed are you who give yourselves over to God, turn your back on the world's sure thing, ignore what the world worships. The world's a huge stockpile, he continues, of God wonders and God thoughts. Nothing and no one comes close to you. I start talking about you telling what I know and quickly run out of words. Neither numbers nor words account for you. See, it's so important that we are living in a way of thanksgiving. If we're living out of a a life of gratitude, then we are constantly recognizing how God is at work. And that's what this psalm is all about. This psalm is all about recognizing God, understanding and seeing him in all things. That whatever happens in our lives, the fact that I woke up this morning is because of God. He put new breath in me for a new day. What I eat today is because of him. What I am able to participate is because of him. All all things are from God, and that's what the psalmist is trying to point out They are so numerous. And and this psalm is trying to reorient, restructure the way in which we view life. That we would recognize that it is all from him. From God. The psalmist goes on to say in verse 6, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but my ears you have opened, burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not require. This is interesting because we know that Old Testament wise that that God did require sacrifices, that God did ask for thanksgiving offerings. And so the psalmist here seems to be contradicting, but really what he's trying to say, really what he's getting after is that there is a tendency for us, there's a tendency for the Hebrew people to bring sacrifices to God, but to have no change in heart, to not be contrite of heart, to not be actually asking for redemption, looking to repent, to change. And the psalmist is saying, you've opened my ears, you've You've helped me hear and understand what you truly desire. We've seen it in other Psalms as well. They say the same thing and then they talk about what you require is a contrite heart, of heart broken, turned in repentance towards God. And I think we have the similar problem. It's just different. Yes, we we don't have sacrifices in the temple that we are bringing to talk to God and and, and to uh, make reparation for. But we still do it, do we not? We we try to change our lives. We we try to be better. We try to do things better, treat people, people better. We try to do things for God, bring offerings and sacrifices in different ways to God. I'll do this, God, if you do that. If I just change this, God, will you do this? But this is not what God is asking of us. He is not asking of us to bring him things. Not to bring something to him. Not to be religious or to be pious. He is simply asking us to change our hearts. To open our ears and to listen. The psalmist continues, Then I said, here I am, I have come, it is written about me in the scroll. I desire to do your will, my God, your law is within my heart. Again, sliding over to Peterson's The Message, puts it in this very personal way, which I love. He says, so I answered, I'm coming, I read in your letter what you wrote about me. And I'm coming to the party 
you're throwing for me. That's when God's word entered my life, became a part of my very being. You see, God isn't asking us to do things for him. God is asking us to allow him into our lives that we might be changed from within, that the Holy Spirit might transform us from within, that he might become a part of us, that we would live out who he is. Not by our own efforts, but by his spirit. Finally, in this second section, he goes on to say, I do not hide your righteousness in my heart. I speak of your faithfulness and your saving help. I do not conceal your love and your faithfulness from the great assembly. This is a great reminder that we circle back to, this, to the first section about the good news. That our job, what God is asking of us as we, as we live out his way of life is that we just tell people about it. This is what God has done for me. This is how he's changed my life. This is what he's doing for me each and every day, how he has blessed me, how he is walking with me. Because when we share these stories with the great assembly, not just with one person, not just keeping it secret to ourselves, but when we share it with everybody, it's an encouragement to our brothers and sisters in Christ. It spurs one another on. It reminds one another. It reminds each of us that he is with us and that he is at work. But for those who do not know, it is telling them, it is bringing to the forefront of their mind that God is at work and he is doing great things. So in this last section, we come to this, this very different shift in the psalmist. And he, he starts out with, do not withhold your mis- uh, mercy from me, Lord. He goes into this plea for, for help. He says, may your love and faithfulness always protect me. You know what, I'm going to read it from the message. It says, now God, don't hold out on me. Don't hold back your passion. Your love and truth are all that keep me together. When troubles ganged up on me, a mob of sins past counting, I was so swamped by guilt I couldn't see my way clear. More guilt in my heart than hair on my head. So heavy the guilt that my heart gave out. Soften up, God, and intervene. Hurry and get me some help so those who are trying to kidnap my soul will be embarrassed and lose face. So anyone who gets a kick out of making me miserable will be heckled and disgraced. So those who pray for my ruin will be booed and jeered without mercy. I love this section because this is that real section talking about the the dirt, about what's going on around us with people around us. God doesn't need us to sugarcoat anything. He doesn't need us to, to make it sound like, hey, there's something going on and it's not good. Uh, God wants us to be very clear and, and he wants us to share the hurts and the pains that are, that are in our lives. He wants us to use real language, whatever that looks like for you. It's okay to share the hurts and pains and to be angry about them, to dislike them and to tell God that. That's what's so great about, these psalm, about the Psalms. He continues in the last two verses. But all who are hunting, hunting for you, oh, let them sing and be happy. Let those who know that you're, what you're all about tell the world you're great and not quitting. And me, I'm a mess. I'm nothing and have nothing. Make something of me. You can do it. You've got what it takes. But God, don't put it off. This real language from the psalmist is so great. 
It is so true. It is so helpful in drawing us into prayer with God, drawing us closer to him. And as he says, we, we need to be real to express the hard times and the good times that people would see God, that people would know God, even through our lives, through our struggles, knowing that we are counting on God. We are waiting and waiting and waiting for God. Because it's on his time, but also because he is the only true one who can rescue us. That's what this psalm is about. It's about acknowledging God, that he is our rescuer, that he does great things for us, and that we are here to proclaim his glory and his name. That all things that we have, the life that we live, is because of his great rescue. And in the midst of that, we can be real with him. We can be real with others. And we need to share our story as we go along. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this psalmist. Thank you that the reminder of Psalm 40 is that you have rescued us, you are at work, and we have the joy of proclaiming your good deeds to the world. That's it. That's all you've asked us to do is in our gratitude to respond and to tell others. Would you put those stories in our hearts that we have them ready, available to share with our friends and family and neighbors Tell them of the great things you're doing. And would you just continue to reveal yourself to us in our everyday lives that we might see your good deeds more and more. Thank you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Good morning, church. One of the things that stands out to me from Psalm 40 is the image given by the writer in verse 1 of God the Father inclining towards him and listening to his cry. When I read this passage, I think of a grandfatherly-like figure leaning into and turning his ear toward his grandchildren, intent on catching every word the child says. As we turn our attention to communion, I'd like us to marry that image of the Father with another of the Son from Matthew chapter 6, where it says in verse 20, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve disciples. These two images, reclining with and inclining towards, help to give a more complete picture of what it means to come around the Lord's table. Reclining with speaks of an outward posture reflective of inner feelings of being relaxed and at ease, knowing you belong and that you are accepted by those you are reclining with. Inclining toward, again, is an outward posture, this time reflected of a person's inner interest in others and a desire to know them better and to be better known by them. In the context of communion, these two postures give a picture of complete presentness where the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, along with you and me, are all present together around the same table, sharing a common loaf and a common cup together with one another. One of the results of COVID-19 is having to isolate ourselves from others, a practice that has taken us away from the Sunday morning gatherings we all cherish so much. The longer this separation from our church family continues, the more we may begin to forget uh, that we are part of this family, and as a result, feel even more alone. Taking communion together each week, albeit each of us in our own homes, can help us remember the important truth that we are not isolated and alone, but still very much a part of the body of Christ and fully present at his table, reclining with our brothers and sisters, 
while we all incline in unison toward our Lord and Saviour, who gave his body and blood for the forgiveness of our sins. Let's pray. Lord, as we partake of the loaf and of the cup together this morning, we remember the isolation you felt on the cross, forsaken by your disciples and even by God himself. Yet you did not allow that isolation to take your faith away, but instead you let it fortify your faith, enabling you to endure until your work was accomplished. As we take the bread that represents your body and drink the cup that represents your blood, help us to remember what you endured on our behalf and that our work here is not yet finished, but rather rolling over into a new chapter whereby even more people will know what it is like to recline at your table and to have the ear of their Father in heaven inclined towards them. Amen. Waiting, waiting, and waiting. If you know me, then you know that I don't like to wait. I'm impatient, and I'm always looking for how I can take the next step to move on to the next thing. If there's a way that I think I can end the waiting, then I'll attempt to do just that. This week, as I was listening to Kelly's sermon, I was reminded that as much as I dislike the waiting, that's often where I grow the most. It's where I have experienced the most character growth in my life. One of the biggest lessons that God has taught me in the waiting periods in my life is to be grateful. To be grateful for what God has done for me and to be grateful for what God is doing in me in the waiting periods. One of the ways that we can show our gratitude to God is through investing in his kingdom. And one of the ways that we can do that is by giving our offerings to our local churches. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you. Thank you that you do put us in periods of waiting so that we can experience growth and develop more Christ-like characters. Thank you for the many ways that you've blessed us. Thank you for these beautiful church congregations who have been so generous during a time where it feels like the whole world has been forced to just stop and wait. Thank you that you are at work in this world. In Jesus' name, amen.
Let's sing one last song together as we finish this morning. Father in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven our father in heaven will lead us not into temptation and God deliver us from the is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Oh, give us each moment all that we need. Forgive us our sins as we forgive the ones that have sinned against us, our Father in heaven, oh, lead us not into temptation, God good to be with you this morning, to worship with you, to listen to God's word together, to celebrate communion together. As you go, let me end with the benediction we use every week at Hope for Life. In light of what we've sung and what we've been taught and what we've heard this morning, go and be the people of God. Go in peace. God bless.